Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Professor Eric Harms, an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology. Professor Harms is a sociocultural anthropologist with research interests in the study of urban and para-urban life and rural-urban transitions. He specializes in the political, economic, and social transformations engulfing the post-colonial megacities of Southeast Asia and has carried out extensive field work in and around Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Today we'll talk with Professor Harms about his newest book, Saigon's Edge. Welcome, Professor Harms. Well, hi. Hi, Marilyn. Thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Great. Um, let's talk a little bit about your book. What is the premise of Saigon's Edge? Well, Saigon's Edge is my first book, and as a young anthropologist, um, I decided that one of the most important things I need to do in this book is really uh, express my commitment to ethnographic description. So the book actually has three projects in it. The most important being the first is really just a simple, straightforward ethnographic description of life on Saigon's Edge, which is the shorthand I use to describe the rural urban transition zone on the outskirts of Ho Chi Minh City. The, se the second project that I have in the book is really to explore what I, what I conceive of as the intersection or the interplay between ideological conceptions and configurations of the rural and the urban as ideal categories and the everyday realities and everyday practices of people who live in, these, in this city. Um, so that second project is really about trying to show the way in which people negotiate systems of ideals with the everyday ways in a, of, of living and the exigencies of being a human being living in the world. And the third project is, <clears throat> as all theoretical works must be in some sense, is an engagement with uh, contemporary urban studies theory. And I try to use the case of Ho Chi Minh City and the ways in which these people negotiate the their lives on the urban margin as a contribution to some of the recent work that's been carried out in other cities around the world and to try to discover what's particularly Vietnamese about this case. So let me talk a little bit about some of those three different areas of interest. In terms of ethnographic description, what I really want to convey is what it's like to live on a city that's on the edge. And when I, when I use this term, the edge, <clears throat> It occurred to me in the middle of my field work that Vietnam itself is a country on the edge. Mm -hmm. it's, on the, it's, it's often portrayed as the next frontier in emerging uh, capitalist markets. It's on the edge of socialism, the edge of capitalism. It's a, uh, as the Vietnamese government describes it, it's a, it's a market economy with a socialist orientation. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm really trying to get to is use the study of everyday life in the city to describe what it means to live on the edge of an economic transformation in that sense. So that's, uh, that's one angle in which I describe the, the contours of social life. But to get to that, you really need to get into people's lives. And so I looked to the edge of the city as a way to describe, in some sense, in a microcosm, the experience of living on the edge both as a nation as a whole and the spatial edge of a city. And I see it as a very interesting place. Um, for example, let me give you a few examples. Um, you have rapid transformation of urban land use. Um, so what was formerly rice producing uh, fields or vegetable farms um, will nowadays be the site of the actual insertion of capital in the form of uh, new factories, Korean, Taiwanese-owned shoe factories, uh, places that are making industrial webbing for export, um, and the, the real insertion of export processing zones that one sees in this rapidly expanding economy really takes place on the edge of the city itself. Um, and so one of the things I try to do is really just tell stories, listen to people as they, as they tell me about their lives. Um, the first thing I did when I arrived into my field site, which is in Hokmon District in the rural urban margin of Saigon, um, was basically walk along the highway. I would sp spend hours every day 
walking along the side of the highway where there were houses that were being demolished. The front of the house was being torn off, literally. The, 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 the front living room of houses would be removed so that they could expand this highway and widen the width of the road. And basically, this is the story that people would tell. Uh, we, they would say, we are sacrificing the front of our homes in order to allow for Vietnamese, for the Vietnamese nation to develop. So this, this notion of being on the edge ultimately emerged out of the stories that people would tell me in the way in which um, someone who used to run a, a little cafe in the front of their house all of a sudden would lose that cafe and uh, sacrifice a, a business opportunity, but reserve their, their antagonism for losing this property and oftentimes submit th their, their, their potential animosity or anger or uh, displeasure and re-articulate that in terms of a, a notion of sacrificing oneself for the, the total development of the country. Um, and other, other things that you would see is uh, people um, trying to carve out niches in which they could um, make, make ends meet. So for example, one of the most enduring images I have in my mind is of cemeteries on the outskirts of the city, which all of the land between the, the tombstones was basically converted into agricultural land. So you have quite literally vegetables growing from oh, the goodness. soil of one's ancestors. Um, and people would talk about these, uh, these, this relationship of Vietnam's past um, and how sacrificing the past in some sense was necessary in order to feed the possibility of the future. Mm -hmm. And so this image, uh, the stories that people would tell about the strategies that they had in order to make ends meet. Um, th these are the kinds of things that I set out to, to really document and detail in, in, in telling the story of Saigon's Edge. Um, Sometimes uh, the stories would be stories of triumph. Um, for example, there was a Vietnamese pig farmer um, who came from the United States. He received, he received workers' compensation payments for a small accident that he had while working in a factory in, uh, in Massachusetts. Then he moved to Saigon's Edge, which he saw as this zone of possibility where he could basically convert um, the money he was getting from workers' compensation payments into investment opportunity. And so then he built this gigantic uh, pig, uh, pig processing factory and lots of, uh, he hired a lot of laborers to take care of these pigs. And in a sense, he saw the edge of the city as this space of potential where he could transform small bits of money that he had earned in the United States into a massive fortune in Vietnam. On the other hand, um, I had other friends who would tell me about the ways in which living on the edge of the city basically was a form of social marginalization, uh, a sense that they had no say in the politics of city planning and the development of the city um, as it grew out over the, la the lands in which they had lived for many generations. And they told me about how the fact that they lived on the outside of the city itself was a form of alienation and displacement where they had no voice. So one of the things that I try to do in the book is to combine these kind of stories of triumph and, and stories of despair and alienation and, and carve out an understanding of built from the stories that people themselves tell about what it's like to live on the edge of a rapidly expanding city. So mm -hmm. did the <clears throat> book grow out of the stories that that people had told you? I mean, mm. how did you come to write the book? Mm. Was it through the stories or did you have an idea prior? Well, it, there's always a little bit of a give and take. And, you know, I was interested in Vietnam and I was interested in notions of the, the, the rapid economic transformation that's taking place there and thinking of a way to have an ethnographic approach to understanding that. Um, and I was interested in some of the simplifications that come when one talks about rural Vietnam and urban Vietnam as these strictly opposed dichotomies. And so looking into the edge, I saw it as a place where all the simplifications are blurred in some sense. So that brought me to the edge of the city and some a place, as I said, I wanted to study a place that had one foot in the country and one foot in the city. 
as a place to really look at urbanization in process. Also a place that I could go back to over time. Mm -hmm. And well, today it's in, this, in the countryside. Five years from now, it will be partially in the city. In 10 years, it'll probably be another suburb of the city itself. Um, so that got me interested in this particular site. Mm -hmm. But as an anthropologist, one of the things that really made it difficult for me to come in with preconceived conceptions is I expected everyone to be angry, you know, to feel cheated or uh, like as victims of some kind of large scale process of capitalization or, you know, the transformation of their livelihoods and things. But I found that, in fact, people weren't angry. They had a much more complex reaction to the transformations taking place. Um, so that's where the stories had to inform the way I understood what I was seeing. Um, and the stories actually, uh, the stories themselves are often quite banal or quite simple. There's nothing dramatic, there's no story uh, of, you know, a, a very strange phenomenon, there's no ghost stories, there's no um, um, outrageous forms of exploitation or, or corruption. Uh, there, there are stories of minor grievances, minor issues, or minor complications that add up to a sense of negotiation and navigation of life on the outer city districts. Now, as I started to hear people talk, one thing did emerge, though, is that, and this is the next premise of the book in some sense, um, trying to understand the idea of symbols and how a city takes on a symbolic meaning. Uh, one of the things I was really interested in is how even though the city is growing rapidly um, and the places that were formerly agricultural are really just uh, new urban sectors of, of the center city um, are still conceived of in strict terms that differentiate the rural from the urban. Now in, in urban studies theory people talk about Southeast Asian cities and there's all kinds of geographers and anthropologists who've invented new terms to describe these kind of places. A famous term is called the desa kota, which is an Indonesian term that combines the words for country and city. It's a kind of country city zone, right? And this is what you see here on the outskirts of Ho Chi Minh City. But the people who live there, they never refer to some kind of anomalous space. They refer to either the inside of the city or the outside of the city, the urban zone or the rural zone. And so I was very fascinated by the way in which despite what we might call empirical or objective transformations of the landscape, nevertheless, people would hold on to very discrete categories that ordered things into what, in the social scientists, we would think as a kind of old-fashioned binary oppositions, um, which is reminiscent of early structuralism or something that often social scientists are now quite skeptical of these simple categories of opposition. Nevertheless, as an anthropologist, you can be skeptical of categories, but you also have to listen to the stories people say and, and that the ways in which people articulate what they, with the way they see the world. And so for me, it was quite fascinating to say, what is, why are people thinking in terms of inside and outside when these differences are obviously so blurred in everyday life? So I started to think, how do, what is a model for this? And this ultimately became the theoretical intervention of the book in some sense, where I, I recognized that the model for inside and outside that one sees laid out on the spatial organization of Ho Chi Minh City is actually analogous and very parallel and very similar to the model of kinship organization that you see in the way in which Vietnamese families are organized. So let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. In Vietnamese kinship, there's a, there's a patrilineal ideal, which is, the, the, which is based on the inner lineage. So if you're a member of a patriline, you're inside the lineage. And in Vietnamese, it's ben noi. Noi means inside. So if you're the father's father, the, the paternal grandfather, you'll be ong noi, which means you're like the inside grandpa. If you're the mother's father in a family, you would be which means the outside grandpa. So in the spatial conception of a kinship relationship, in the ideal form, um, you have this notion that there's an inside and an outside. Now what's actually quite fascinating about how that, that kind of kinship system works is that when a wife marries into the family, there's an implicit contradiction that takes place. 
the wife comes from her own patriline in some sense, marries into the patriline of her husband, and she is the outsider who enters into the city. Now, the wife in traditional Vietnamese folklore, mythology, and like discussions of the role of the wife, the wife is both highly denigrated and also idealized as this pure other who is important to the reproduction of the lineage. So what's very fascinating, it gets complicated. Yes, I bet. But, so you have a, a very simple contradiction, actually. The wife comes from the outside, and her job is to reproduce the inside. But the inside both denigrates and valorizes the wife. Now, if we look at the city, the way people conceptualize the city, it's exactly the same. The outer city districts are, are both simultaneously uh, seen as the wasteland of the city, the place where you put polluting factories and all these kind of dangerous elements of the outside are often symbolically associated with the outside of the city, but it's also the place where agriculture and all of the fresh foodstuffs of the city come in. It's also sometimes called the la foy, which means the lungs of the city. So in the idealized symbolic understanding of the relationship of the inside of the city and the outside of the city, it's actually structurally very similar to the relationships in kinship. So this was interesting to me. I didn't know what to do with it. But ultimately what I realized was if we look at kinship and the way in which people navigate kinship relations, mm -hmm we see that people are constantly transgressing ideals. For example, there's this contradiction, the role of the wife to reproduce. She's supposedly denigrated, all these things, and she's also idealized. But in real, in real everyday practice, people's families are much more complex. And there's actually an oscillation between this patrilineal ideal model and a bilateral model of kinship that really valorizes the wife's side of the family as well and actually opens up kinship relations to a wide swath of all potential family relations. So there's a notion of the inside as the ideal, but there's also a simultaneous valorization of the outside. But they're posed, when you, when you look at them in ideal terms, they're posed as oppositions. They, they seem like a contradiction. But in fact, in all, all studies of Vietnamese kinship, people realize that most Vietnamese social actors, in reality, oscillate between these two forms. What it does, that oscillation, it allows one to ca capitalize on both the advantages of a kind of strong rooted patriline that's grounded in space. Like for example, a patriline also has, a, has land and property. Mm -hmm. You're located in space. You have a kind of permanent home address, right? Um, but when your outside relations are often spatially mobile, not fixed in place and hard to, and they have very little history attached to them but they spread out across territory. You could find members of the outside in California or in France, and it, well dispersed across mm -hmm. territory. In creating very strict dichotomies of inside and outside, people are able to create spaces of potential movement that actually allows them to generate power, both symbolic and also very real material capital through this oscillation mm -hmm. between space. So for example, the pig farmer who I mentioned the guy who um, got money from um, his, his workers' compensation payments in the United States, took that money, invested it in the outer city districts of Ho Chi Minh City, he's actually able to enact a form of oscillation where he takes advantage of the outer city districts as a site of, sort of cheap land, but he's able to create a, a notion of his own self and his own lineage, which is rooted in a more dis dis discrete, bounded, entity. So he's able to oscillate between generating capital in one place outside of Vietnam, but also to uh, insert that capital into the rural urban margins and actually generate a certain productivity out of that relationship. So how does Saigon's Edge fit into the other work you've mm -hmm. done in Vietnam? Well, one of the things that I've been trying to do in all of my work in Vietnam is uh, one is to understand there's these large structural processes, right? You have uh, globalization, urban transformations, you have you know, uh, rapid expansion of cities that's taking place all over the world, right? So one of the things I'm trying to do here is to really find what's Vietnamese about this. So that's one of the reasons why I'm trying to explain some of these possibilities through a, mm -hmm. a Vietnamese kinship model. I could just say it's, uh, well, it's just 
the imperatives of capital, right? To expand outward and occupy more and more territory. And, you know, some people call it the obliteration of space through time that takes place in rampant global capitalism. That's one element, but there's also, it's different than Cochabamba, Bolivia. It's different than Lagos. It's different than other cities where these processes are taking place. So that's one thing. The other thing I'm really interested in is the, the, the link between symbolic meaning of space the way in which space takes on certain sensibilities and meanings and um, the material ramifications of that. Um, so for example, if we, if we look at the, the symbolic relation of inside and outside in Vietnamese cities, we can study that as a kind of symbolism, you know, that's linked to certain ideas of cosmologies and things like that, yin and yang metaphors and things of that that are quite prevalent in Vietnamese thinking. But we can also look at the very particular effects of those symbolic reckonings that transform, like quite literally, like the value of real estate, the ability of people to generate capital, the people, the way in which people comport their bodies. Uh, to represent themselves as peasants when they walk into the city mm -hmm. in order to sell goods. That has a kind of symbolic value, but it also generates economic capital as well. So that's one thing. Another issue that I'm very interested in, and this is the direction of my future work, is to take some of the ideas about the symbolic meaning of space on the outer city districts and apply it to the inner city district. So I've moved in, so to speak, in my research has gone from the outside in because a lot of the symbolic meaning that I discovered on the outer city district and that was really affecting people's lives, well, that's generated by discourses and ideas of the city that often emerge from the centers of power and from emerging middle class in downtown Ho Chi Minh City. And so my new project is to create what I call a, the, a map of the spatial divisions of labor in Ho Chi Minh City to really create a, uh, an ethnographic map that emerges from interviews and stories and working with colleagues at the University of Social Sciences and Humanities in Ho Chi Minh City to create a map of the way in which different districts in the city are uh, attributed certain symbolic meanings and how that relates to the actual productive activity that takes place. Mm -hmm. Like a working class district all of a sudden becomes a place where there's a lot of motorbike repair shops or a, a fancy district has lots of high-end cafes and discos and things. But like to really systematize what at this point are sort of relatively anecdotal observations mm -hmm. about the city, but systematize it and understand how all of these places are intermixed and interlocked with each other in a kind of large-scale division of labor. Um, other things, uh, studying civilizational discourse, the way in which um, people, there's a rhetoric of civilization, it's called Ven Minh in Vietnamese, which is often used to uh, legitimize the displacement of large sections of the population from certain parts of the city. And oftentimes, what I argue is that basically, the, the discourse of Ven Minh, of civilization, is a kind of a veiled system of privatization, basically. Okay. Well, all very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for being here with us mm -hmm. today and sharing some of your work. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed talking about this. Great. For more information about Professor Harms and his work, including his book, Saigon's Edge, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Please be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Great.